Howdy, Ags. Welcome to Aggie Growth Hacks, the podcast sponsored by the McFerrin Center for Entrepreneurship at Texas A&M. And we're dedicated to helping entrepreneurs improve their business, connect with other Aggie entrepreneurs, and support one another. I'm your host, Greg Martin, Fighting Texas Aggie Class of 2001. And I'm your co-host, Chris Hunter, Fighting Texas Aggie Class of 1998. Whoop. We got a little story for you, Ags. Spencer Walker, Fighting Texas Aggie EBV Class of 2022, is the CEO of NoraWork a groundbreaking technology company that is using AI to process medical data that can literally save someone's life. Spencer's journey through the fundraising slog is one that many entrepreneurs have traveled, and we hope that you enjoy learning how Spencer is hacking a clear path through the fundraising jungle. So pass it back and listen up to Spencer as he shares some really good bull. Well, Spencer, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see you again. It's always a great time to have EBVers on the Aggie Growth Hacks podcast. Thanks for joining us. Excited to catch up with you. Excited to learn about what's going on in you and your business. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, let's just jump right into it. Give us, you give us the 60-second background, your military background, your entrepreneurial journey. How did it kind of start? And where are you now? Oh, man. Yeah, that's... Uh... That's a fun hole to go down. But yeah, I started off in the Marine Corps, I served in special oper well, infantry, then special operations. I got burned out after combat operations in Afghanistan. And three months later, after I got out, somehow I was in Iraq. So it did a weird dynamic there and ended up doing that for 10 years, just working overseas for the government, different areas, different projects. And I finally just, I started to really notice this gap in, in medical device technology specifically, where it relates to battlefield triage. And that's where I founded NeuroWorks, which was actually is it was a weird offshoot of a different company that was Defense Tech. It was just so unique that it needed to be its own IP under its own company. That's super cool. So tell us a little bit more about NeuroWorks. What exactly is is NeuroWorks? What what exactly do you do? What is it? How who does it help? Yeah, absolutely. So NeuroWorks pairs biosensors with AI for predictive diagnostics. So we take biosensors, whether that's a photoplethysmography, so on the back of your Apple smartwatch or any other device that has that light. And what that does is it picks up these volumetric changes in your blood pressure and your blood vessels. And what that does is allow us to see heart rate, body temperature, basic things. And so what we did is we took and we added these different sensors, whether it's a thermistor or an EKG, and we're able to pick up your entire physiology. And so it's really unique. And with pairing it with AI, we can take squiggly lines. So think of a heartbeat. And we can actually have the AI analyze it and tell you whether or not it's in a baseline. And so it's what it's one. It's that's just one simple example. And what we did did from there is we saw how capable the software was that we were developing. Took a, a wireless EEG, so an electroencephalogram you've probably seen on people's heads for brain injuries. And we took that, paired it with that, and we thought, okay, can we take these five brain waves, squiggly lines, and can we get it to interpret that as well into mental health disorders, brain injuries? I mean, you see oftentimes, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced going to a neurologist, but I have having suffered multiple TBIs. It took years to get a diagnosis. And so with this, I literally just plop it on. And I was like, oh, it told me TBI. I see it. And same thing on the mental health side. We're, we've had a lot of success with PTSD and TBI. We've gone into other realms, anxiety, depression, but those were the two we were focused on. And so we were able to do the same thing and differentiate because oftentimes there's huge overlap whether, you know, especially for veterans, you go to the VA and they're instantly, okay, you're not sleeping well, you're a little sad, you're, you're, you're lack of motivation, you know, maybe outbursts, whatever it is. And they instantly go to PTSD where it overlaps with low testosterone, it overlaps with traumatic <coughs> brain injury, and they're all the same symptoms, but we don't do anything to try to differentiate. And so that's just, that's just two examples of the technology, but at the core, it's the software. So Spencer, why, why? why this why did you start to say okay this is something that it's obviously needed i mean that that's blatantly obvious but why to say okay this is what i want to do where i want to pour my passion where i want to spend my days well so it's a mix of a personal journey so you know having gone through it you know i want to say it was like finally 2016 you know five years after i left the military where i was like i think i'm not okay <laughs> and like and it was a weird conundrum and I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what to do. And then, of course, when I finally started to really take it serious and you know started seeing a neurologist, then COVID happened. And then telehealth was just worthless. And then we're getting literally paper vaccine cards, which didn't get vaccinated. But that's besides the point. But yeah, we're like I saw this this total lapse. It, it, we live in this digital age, and we're not utilizing our technology. 
We have we literally have cat ears on eBay that can stand up if you're happy and go down if you're sad. But we don't have this technology implemented in the medical side. So I was really curious, and that's where it started. It was just this this basic curiosity: how do I make myself better, and ca- am I capable of doing that, or at least knowing? And then the other side was the military had come out the DoD. They had all their different visions for 2030 and what it was going to look like going forward. And so we realized, okay, get her on the battlefield. You're going to have an hour before you're going to get, you know, that you can count on, you know, roughly that you'll be medically evacuated. So it was, okay, let's just stop the bleeding, make sure they're, they're patched up and get them on a helicopter. And we talk about this 90% battlefield survivability, you know, that we've grown since 2001. But it doesn't talk about dying of wounds, which is after they get on the on the aircraft and out. So it's like that's more than World War II and Vietnam combined, which is insane. You, you like a lot of people don't don't believe it, but the, <clears throat> the dying of wounds rate is much higher. And so if we're able to get this device in the hands of guys on the battlefield where they can put it on their buddy, and we're able to have higher command than see this and say, okay, we're just going to use a color code: red, yellow, and green. Green means they can stay there a little bit longer. We don't have to use this helicopter. Get it out there yellow a little iffy but we're going to give them more support in red it's it's up in the air it's either based on location like it's too remote we can't get too far or it's and this is something that ai is all calculating based on your limited resources or it's just their their vitals are trending down and this is not somebody that we're going to be able to get to in time and it's just like you know comfort care at that point and it sucks but it's the reality of war and so, you know, all of this kind of stemmed just from there and branched out into these different areas. We've had Hewlett Packard Enterprises hit us up for something called state, uh, stadium enhancement, stadium experience enhancement. So I'm sure you guys have been to concerts where people, Taylor Swift did it, you know, the glowing wristbands that that's, you know, this, this wireless device is, is your, your ticket. It's how you're paying for things. It has lights because it's fun. But we thought, okay, what if we put it, or HPE thought, what if we put a sensor in there to get analytics from them now, where they're able to see how long is the bathroom line? You know, how long is the hot, you know, how long is it to get a hot dog? And where's the rest of the people in my party that are with me? But what we're getting from the user is these colors make you more thirsty. Do these, you know, does does this flashing of this or whatever make you want to return again? So it's it's very useful to the business. But, you know, and... It goes from the, from Battlefield to that, and then it goes to, we had Blue Origin, so Chris Zembrowski, he was one of the inspiration for astronauts, and we were kind of baffled when he approached us, not because of who he was or anything, but what he told us, and it was that we don't track astronaut vitals. So you can detect a seagull farting a mile away from a spaceship, but you don't know what's going on with the people controlling the craft. They had to fight to, get, to try to get Apple Watches, to, wow. to be like, hey, can you track our heart rate? Like... It was insane. Wow. So right. we're like, we could easily take a five dollar sensor and toss it in there, and we could have it, you know, streamed. <laughs> I don't understand. Like, no one's done this, and so we really started to see these gaps. And I know it seems like it's blasted all over the place. It's like, okay, what is what is the the you know NeuroWorks? What is you know the this yeah. whole product suite is called BioSync? So like, what is it? And at the core, the software is the same for everything. For everything. So if you think of it like Apple. Not comparing myself to Apple at all, but if you think of like Apple, it's like iPhone, iMac, or I compute, whatever, all the i things, i vacuum, i microwave, all all of it. The core is always the same, and so we're kind of taking the same approach. It's like Google started as a search engine, yet where's Google today? You know, it's 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 insane. So I can see it like applications inside of sports for it, right? Like real time, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, the, the, the sports one is, is, man, God, the, you get into the politics of this stuff. We had a couple different people that we had worked with at a clinic down in Denver. When we were doing our clinical trials, we had somebody come in, but you know, not going to name him, but professional NFL player for the Broncos. And uh, he was experiencing signs of CTE. We we're very, you know, very rapidly able to diagnose that. And that was cool is not only were we able to diagnose it using our software, but then we were able to actually show if it was if he was improving in real time you know whether medication was working tr- different treatments therapy everything what was interesting was he was you know giving the suggestion of man we could integrate this into the helmets and yeah. then you get hit and we can know okay next hit i'm going to get a brain injury i'm going to i'm going to sit out and right. it was like that's a great idea let's do that but of course on the other side was the nfl being like 
No, they're good. Eight you know, percent of our players be off. <laughs> yeah, off the no, field yeah. In the and first, it's a, it's a quarter. It's a hard balance, you know. It's it's one of those things. It's like we want to take care of our players, but we also want to entertain the people and make money. So applications where we could actually see that more realistically would be college sports, uh, where you know players and coaches really do, they really, really are invested in their health, you know, long term, and also in the military where. There's a give and take. So it's like, yes, there's inherent risks to this, but we do have the resources where I always like using the example of like the NBA. It's like you have you have Smith and he's out there and you see him running up and down the court and all of a sudden you're like, man, he's kind of he's kind of dragging. Like, let's put him on the bench and send Jones out. Why don't we do that to the military? Instead, we're just like, no, get up, keep going. It's like, why yeah. not? We R- have like rub some dirt on it. You're fine. Yeah. We yeah. we have all these other people. Why can't we just rotate out one guy or give him a break? Like, or even do it, you know. You uh, as a unit, and I know that we've gotten, you know, a little bit drawn down on our our deployment links and and our op tempo because we're not involved in two wars. But it still is one thing that's not not utilized in in real time. And it's I think it's getting better, but it's also something where the the tech could be easily be there instead of using you know like the the Google Glass and guys are throwing up. I don't know if you saw that whole thing. They're trying to integrate this whole. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Waste of billions of dollars. But wow. yeah. With no great use. Well, especially let, let's kind of come back to Norwalk. So, so tell us a little bit about your team. I mean, the the things that you're tackling and what you're doing are mind-bogglingly complex. I, I mean, is is this you sitting there writing code at night and is sitting there soldering, you know, Apple watches together? <laughs> oh my God! Who, who have you attracted around you to to do this? So I, I started off using this platform that pairs the company or, you know, industry with universities. And I was very, I mean, it worked out amazing. I, I honestly can't believe how awesome it is. So we had our, our first team was from a university up in Canada and they gave us these engineering students. So I had 11 of them that were working on a project. They had to work on, on my project. They weren't getting paid. They had, you know, six months to complete it. I mean, you, you post your project, what you need done. And then the schools all, you know, pretty much compete to to have their students do it. That was the initial jump start because yeah, I was literally soldering little tiny boards together, had this nest of wires going between things, all you know, breadboards spread everywhere, and really it didn't even need to be that complicated. I just didn't honestly, I didn't know what I was doing. I had to I had to learn all of this. Yeah, so initially the University up in Canada, they they helped out a ton. CU Boulder, we ended up pairing up with them. I ended up with two medical students and two one software engineer and one data scientist and then a a girl from accounting, which I used her more than I used the other four, believe it or not. I was like, I don't know what I got, what I'm going to do with you. But she helped out a ton. Yeah. Bean counters students. really do rule the world. <laughs> oh man, absolutely. That was, I had more questions for her. We'd be on a, like a Zoom call and I'm like, wait, wait, the accountant was, I, I have like 10 more questions. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing. Extremely helpful. Especially when I was coming up with a pro forma, she knocked it out of the park and she's actually somebody that still is helping out with our team today. And uh, yeah, so all of that, I ended up recruiting, you know, various students and Aggies Create ended up being the most recent. And so Vanch and, and the team over there, I mean, they have been absolutely astonishing. Not just amazing in what they produce, but amazing in their belief and their passion. They're like, we want to do this long term. We believe in this. We want to do this. So they've been my go to. They've also been very, very faithful and patient because we had a funding round back in, it started back October last year. And went through three months of due diligence, came December, had this final meeting on a Friday, and they pulled the plug. And it was, it was like, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I trust me. I had like irons and in, in, in five different VCs at the time. And uh, I told all of them, I was like, hey, we're going to go with these guys. They're a venture capital authority. So their fund is backed by the state. And I don't know. it made so much sense. But then, uh, you know, once it got there, the owner of the fund, and I won't mention who they are, they are based in Colorado. They had, they were pretty odd. Awesome. Good dude, CFO awesome, CEO awesome, all the managing partners awesome. Is the owner who is like, I just don't see this being in our wheelhouse. And I'd already been talking to a company that they had funded. They're more in like information and satellites and stuff like that. And we were already like, you know, brainstorming all this different stuff that we were going to do together. So yeah, it was a it was a big blow. It was great learning experience though. It was one of those kicking yourself in the butt type situations. Definitely laid in bed, you know, the next morning until like wow. noon. And I was like, why? Yeah. But it, it, it's all worked out. And you know, we've we've still been feeding off grants and submitting to small business innovation research proposals. So yeah, everything's still moving forward. It's just you know, I always see it as uh, 
my fiance always says protect or rejection is protection. So I'm just going with that mindset that it happened for a reason. So we'll find we'll find the exact right one at the right time. Love that. Yeah. So what's beyond that right there, you know, getting rejected, right? By by the VCs. What else has been the biggest challenge that you've been facing? Oh my God. I really appreciate that question. This is this was one that I've thought about. Cause there's, there's so many different challenges in business. But with this specifically, I mean, obviously in the beginning, I feel like there's a learning curve. There's there's mm-hmm. the my heart's in this and mm-hmm. everybody says I need a business plan. So I'm gonna just really nail that down. And then you end up, you know, going to a program like EBB and you're like, oh, what really matters is if I know what I'm talking about and I'm able to convince people, not just see like, look at this sweet little sheet I made. I feel like there's a lot of different things, but like truly at this point, the biggest challenge has been filtering out the noise, knowing who to trust. And I mean, <clears throat> even with your time, not not just like in general, like if they're going to be a good person or not, but like who to trust with your time. That's everything for you guys are probably on LinkedIn. How many messages do you get where it's like, I want to connect and help you out and we're going to do all these things. And like, so it's like small things like that all the way to, you know, three months of due diligence with a VC that might just pull the plug. So it's like, that's been, that's been the biggest challenge is knowing who to trust with my time. Initially, I would just like, even with the the LinkedIn people, you know, I would get a message, you know, somebody who's going to help out with funding and all these things. And it's like, it seems like it's all, we're, you know, I'm making assumptions like, oh, they're just going to take a fee. And then I find out in their, their deck, they're like, yeah, and you know, for $4,000 a month, you're going to get all this support and all these things. And I'm like, Initially, the beginning, the naive version of me was like, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds great. And I just sit there for like two hours where they're doing this whole thing and even follow up. Like they'd send an email, how's that? Oh, great, talking to my team. You know, like, because I was embarrassed or prideful. I didn't want to say, like, I, don't, I can't afford that. And I also don't want to pay for it. Yeah, it's finally gotten to a point where, or, you know, at least over the last uh, probably, you know, year, you know, something comes up. I'll just completely be honest, like, no, I don't like that. And it's worked out. We've had a couple of different, uh, you know, brokers that have helped out, especially with Regulation A funding, which you know, it's basically like crowdsourcing. It's been a good thing where you can be a little, you got to be more assertive. So that's been my biggest challenge. But it's also something that, as you're going through, you're you're obviously learning, and, and you know, it's it's a little ironic that that a super stud like you is like, yeah, I need to learn how to be more assertive. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I think Spencer could be assertive. It's it's but it's it's building the confidence in in what that area. You know, I mean, if if you had to go kick down a door and clear a room, I think you could be assertive in doing that. But but entrepreneurship is a learning journey, right? Oh, and, absolutely. And learning everything together, and and so to be confident in where you are, and and using that confidence in those those hard lessons to push NeuroWorks forward to success is definitely had you grown a whole lot. Completely. Where do you see NoraWorks in five, 10 years? What, what's your BHAG? You know, five, 10 years from now, hopefully five. My ultimate goal, and this is a lot different than a lot of entrepreneurs, especially this isn't my first company. So it's a little bit more unique than a lot of first time business owners. But my ultimate goal is to IPO and sell. Like I... It's not because I hate it or because I'm like, ah, this is stupid. It's because I want to move. I have other projects that I want to work on, but my biggest goal is an exit. And also, you know, like we had been joking about before, I don't want to be CEO of my company. My full time job is fundraising right now. I literally don't know what's happening on the day to day anymore. I'm like, okay, cool. That's great. Yeah, here's a panini press. Keep working. But I, that's actually a true story. I, I had to pay my engineers in a panini press. I, I want to just move the business forward and, and keep moving the, the, the goalposts and, and scaling. You know, hopefully after IPO, be able to have, you know, my valuation that I want to be at is I want to be able to exit with 75 million. And I know that's ambitious or whatever. I'm hoping it's a lot more. But I want to be able to take that and reinvest it into my next project, which would be photothermal therapy, which is think of it, you know, the best way to explain it, you know, high level would be you inject these little tiny nanobots, they go in and what they're going to do is target cancer cells and they're going to latch onto the cancer. You're going to use a laser to heat them up and it's going to disintegrate the cancer. It's a therapy that would be 100% effective. And I'm sure somebody out there is going to be like, no, it's not, but whatever. As far as we can tell, it's very effective. It's not a cure. It's a treatment. It's a, you know, it'd be something that would happen every time cancer shows up, but you would be cancer free. And that's extremely close, to, uh, near and dear to me because my, my brother, he was also a Marine. He passed away last July from leukemia. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where it's like all the new and exciting treatments and all these different things. And so I was like really in the loop on all these different things going on and really want, I want, I felt like I can do something about this, you know? 
And then my dad, he had had prostate cancer. And I saw him go through the MD Anderson Center, actually down in Houston. And they do the proton beam therapy, which is very similar to it, it's similar in a way that they're using this high energy radiation and targeting exactly where the cancer is. It's very non invasive. It's not like, you know, the how disgusting chemo can be and how, you know, toxic can be to, to the individual. But yeah, so that's, uh, that's ultimately where where I want to go. That's ultimately where I want to be. There's some other other things I want to be doing in there, but that's that's the big goal with NeuroWorks. Wow. Spencer, that that's really cool. I mean, definitely a big ambition there. And I love, love, love the idea of kicking cancer's butt, you know. So all right, we're we're gonna head into our lightning round now. Are you ready, Spencer? I'm ready, yeah. We have some rules here, right? My rules are a little bit different than Greg's rules. Greg's <laughs> rules is that you have 30 seconds. I'm gonna give you a minute, right? to answer each one of these questions. You ready for that? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So question number one, what is your favorite personal hack book podcast? Anything goes where Aggie growth hacks. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, clearly my favorite book is the ultimate guide to digital marketing for roofers. <laughs> yeah. I still have the yes. best review. <laughs> best on there. answers. Yes. Best answer. That's ever. the best answer ever. Yes. <laughs> have, you, have you guys, I'm sure Chris has, have you seen my review, Greg? I have not. <laughs> It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. I, I you got to go on there, go on Amazon, check it out, read the reviews. You'll be you'll be blown away. But yeah, honestly, I probably have you know two to three different books that I, I'm reading on any given week. But my my favorite one right now that I'm reading is "Is the Courage to Be Disliked," and it, it's based on Adlerian psychology mixed with philosophy, and it's just it, it's one of those things that challenges your your thinking, and it's it's definitely been very useful, and especially in a world where we're so used to putting band-aids on everything and telling everybody they're okay. And oh, that's your trauma. Uh, not that I'm criticizing that. I just think it's a very unique way of looking at it where it's like, it's not based on your past. It's based on how you're going to do things going forward. Spencer, what is the best business hack that you have? Oh man, ChatGPT for sure. So a AI has been extremely useful as a business hack. Mm -hmm. Everything from you know creating pitch decks, putting together presentations to literally coding, it's all gotten so much better. So I mean, yeah, ChatGPT 100% has been one of the most useful business hacks. I I, I can't tell you a, enough how, especially when I talk to people, I'm like, well, have you thought about putting in ChatGPT? I even formulating emails. It's like, yeah, it's been extremely useful. And once you, you know, kind of have your stuff built out, you can really, really use it to your advantage. Yeah, there's another thing in there. One of my recommendations for books, for business, best business book would be Super Founders. So, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's a quote that I had actually uh, taken and it's, there is no single path to success. Billion dollar companies are built by founders who break the rules, challenge norms and embrace their unique journey. And so, I mean, I think that that belief really reinforces that success in business requires unconventional thinking and a willingness to take risks. You know, I think Blake Petty is probably one of the, mm -hmm. the biggest rock star. I mean, he is, he's the rock star McFerrin. And, you know, one of the biggest things that that he taught, you know, all of us, especially me, was how to pitch. Outside of learning how to pitch and how important that is, I think one of the biggest things that everybody walked away from, you know, he doesn't say, I'm going to make you an entrepreneur. It was, do you want to be an entrepreneur? And it basically challenged the idea with a lot of people showing up, a lot of retired military that thought, I'm just going to hang out. And it's like, that's not a business, that's a hobby. So if you're not working over 40 hours a week as an entrepreneur, you have a fun hobby that's probably costing more money than than you're making. And, and that's okay if that's what Absolutely. you want. There, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, <laughs> growing something, it's not easy. Oh, trust me. I'd love to have passive income. I see these things on my feed all the time. It's like, you know, 25 year olds making 40 grand a month doing nothing. I work 20 minutes a day. You know, it's like, <laughs> I want that. But like, it's, you not get that as a, like, yeah, it's totally different. All right, Spencer, what is the best advice that you've been given and 2015 bonus points since you're a class of 15 for how you actually applied it? Have you guys ever seen the uh, Ernest Shackleton, you know, men wanted poster? So for the Endeavor journey. So, it, you know, to kind of paraphrase it, it's, you know, arduous journey, low wages, cold nights, and, it, and it's like honor and success in case of, you know, or honor and glory in case of success. And it's like, I think that, you know, I had a, I had a mentor a while ago that he's like, I was in Mexico working and he's like, pull this up on your phone, look at it. And he's like, read it to me. And I read it to him. He goes, that's what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And I was like, there's no promise. There's no promise. There's no guarantee. It's going to suck. And uh, 
but you, the outcome, if you are successful, is, is great. And I think having that mindset, knowing that it's going to be difficult, but that you can you can get there if you if you put in the work. Well, Spencer, how can the Aggie Growth Hacks family get in touch with you? How can we encourage you? How can we support you and NeuroWorks? Obviously, you can get in touch with me through email. It's swalker at n-u-r-o-w-e-r-x dot com, and I'm always available pretty good at responding to emails. It's definitely getting a little flooded. You can hit me up on there. You can find me on LinkedIn. It's just Spencer H. Walker. <laughs> S. Walker, N-U-R-O is the, you know, in slash whatever. I'm here to, to support you guys. I'm here to support. I, you know, right now still participating with the EBV program. I'm attended as an alumni guest speaker. I interviewed candidates uh, for the last one and I'm interviewing ones for the next upcoming one. And then, you know, the only thing outside of that is I'm always trying to weasel my way into the Aggie Angel Network. If they're listening, hi, great opportunity for you guys. But yeah, so I mean, that, that would be the only place. And obviously, that's because my full time, you know, soul sucking position right now is, is fundraising. Well, Spencer, thank you so much for coming on a Growth Hacks and really just sharing everything that you shared with us. It was really cool learning about NeuroWorks and, and really your entrepreneurial journey. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. No, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I, I am a huge fan of the podcast. Uh, you guys rank right up next to one of my other favorite ones. So it's it's definitely something I look forward to nonstop. I think you guys have such a great introspection on everything. It's absolutely exceptional. Well, how about that, Ags? Was that awesome or what? I know that I've got a whole page full of notes here. I always do with all these these Aggie entrepreneurs or EBV entrepreneurs, right? What was your biggest takeaway there, Greg? But I was just so impressed, not only with the drive that Spencer has to kind of go through all the, the, the fundraising challenges that he's living right now, but to say, okay, that's what it takes to, for the company to survive, but the creativity that he used and, and just, I mean, how he pulled in resources from different universities, different organizations, different nonprofits yeah. to be able to, to come together and develop this company. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, and of course, yeah, I mean, you would hope that an AI company actually uses AI to make it better. And right. so he's practicing what he preaches, which which is pretty amazing. And it just makes me want to continue to explore the AI possibilities as well. But to see how he's doing it and he's running so amazingly lean mm -hmm. and to really do something that has got some major impacts. And I can't, I mean, I can't wait to see him. You know, you see those, uh, those pictures of people like ringing the bell when they first get listed on NASDAQ. Yeah. I yeah. can't wait to see Spencer do that and then follow and be like, okay, how long is it going to take for him to exit and hit that $75 million <laughs> exactly. payday that, exactly. that he's looking for, for, for investing. But anyway, what, what about you, Chris? What'd you take away from Spencer? Where he mentioned that his biggest challenge is filtering out the noise, right? And, and he talked about that and really knowing who to trust with. And this was the important part of all of this is who to trust with his time, right? Because Bingo. Yep. your time is the only resource that you have that is finite. You're not going to get any more time than anybody else in the entire world, right? And you have to utilize it as best as you possibly can. So, and, and that's what I've had to learn over the years as being an entrepreneur myself is, is that my time is, is very valuable. And it's not until I start valuing my own time and what comes into my life does it make sense for anyone else to value that time as well? Anyways, that's that's my biggest takeaway from from this entire episode is got to filter things out and, and and value your time. Hundred percent. That is so easily said, mm -hmm. so hard to do. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Ags, we hope that you had a wonderful time listening to Spencer. We loved learning about him and what he's doing with his company. If you're not connected with him, make sure that you do that. And if you're in the medical AI technology space, make sure you really connect with them because I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's something that y'all can do to work together. If you're not connected with Chris or I or uh, Aggie Growth Hacks on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, please make sure you do that and give this episode a big Texas Aggie, give them thumbs up and subscribe on whatever podcast app you're listening. We want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, the McFerrin Center for Entrepreneurship at Texas A&M University. Since 1999, the McFerrin Center for Entrepreneurship has served as the hub of entrepreneurship for Texas A&M. If you're an Aggie entrepreneur or even a wantrepreneur, head on over to their website right now to find a program that's right for you. 
Just go to aggiegrowthhacks.com forward slash McFerrin. Well, Ags, join us next time when we connect with another great Aggie entrepreneur and learn how they hack their growth. Till then, I'm Chris Hunter. And I'm Greg Martin. Thanks and gig them.